everybody. My name is Joanna Caudill and I am a mechanical engineer turned teacher. I spent about half my career as a mechanical engineer working for a big global construction company. And then I, after uh, about 20 years now, uh, I transitioned to teaching and I've been teaching physics and an engineering elective and also coordinating a STEM program at a high school near DC. I'm so excited today to um, welcome you to this challenge. I think it's such an interesting topic, machine learning. And um, I thought I'd start by telling a little bit about myself and my journey to engineering, and then we'll dive into the challenge. So I wanted to share a bit about my um, educational background. I did a program that is a little unique, I think. It's called a dual, dual degree program. And the benefit of it is it allows you, number one, to not have everything totally figured out before you go to college. Believe me, you don't have to have everything figured out in high school. Um, and secondly, it allows you to explore a few different majors and degree programs before ultimately deciding. And then in five years, you come away with two degrees. So for me, this was particularly uh, a valuable program for me to be involved in because um, I was an international student. I'm originally from England and my parents were from England. We didn't know a whole lot about the American college system. And so for me, it was really helpful to have a bit of time to explore some majors and also to get my feet under me as I was heading off to college from high school. So I did a program starting at a small liberal arts school called the University of the South. It's located right near, right outside Chattanooga in the mountains. And um, there I studied physics, math, courses that I'd enjoyed in high school, but also English, geology, art history. It allowed me to have a bit more time to explore some different uh, subjects and learn what I really was passionate about. And what I discovered was I really liked the applied aspects of math in physics. I really liked how you could use math to model the physical world. And then of course the cool things that you get to study in physics. But because I liked the hands-on aspect of my science classes so much, I thought that engineering would be a great option for me. And so I did choose to do a, this dual degree program. So after three years at Sewanee and getting all my prerequisites out of the way, I transferred to Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And there I began to study uh, mechanical engineering. I chose mechanical engineering because I found that I was really enjoying classes in physics like thermodynamics and fluid mechanics. The classes that allow you to, to look at the flow of heat and energy through systems, the flow of fluids and air across surfaces. And so I thought I could get into airplane design or engine performance design um, as I went off to engineering school. I continued to take those classes and um, learned about studying the performance of cycles and system to try to optimize, get as much out of a cycle as much energy out of a cycle as possible, so to optimize the performance. And that kind of study really lends itself well to the power sector. So when I graduated from school, from college, uh, I went to work as a mechanical engineer for a big global construction company called Bechtel. Um, I should say that with this dual degree program, another nice thing is you get to graduate with your peers from your first college after four years. And then you go back and finish one more year uh, at your second school, at your engineering school, and then you graduate with your fellow students from your engineering school. So you still get to sort of be in both colleges together. You don't have to leave all your, your college friends behind from one school when you go to the next one. So think about that as an option. There's currently great options where you can go to community college and get your prerequisites out of the way and then transfer to engineering school. There's technical schools that allow you to do these kinds of dual degree programs. So it can be a great way to give you a bit more flexibility 
if you don't quite have it all figured out yet. So what did I do as a mechanical engineer in the power business? Um, I was responsible for the mechanical systems, the mechanical design on a power plant. Those are things like the pumps, the heat exchangers, the turbines that um, produce the electricity. And so the picture in the top left is a, is a boiler feed pump. This is one of the major pumps in a power plant cycle. And it's responsible for taking um, water from a, from a reservoir and pumping it to a boiler where the boiler heats it up, turns it into steam, and then it moves on to drive a steam turbine to produce electricity. These, port, these pumps are very, very large, thousands of horsepower, and if you were to stand next to one, you would probably only come up halfway in that impeller, that creamy impeller section that you see in the picture. As a mechanical engineer, I would have to understand the performance needs for this pump, and then I would write a specification and send it off to vendors so that they knew they needed to see if their particular kind of pump could produce the performance I needed. They would offer me a proposal and a price, and then I would evaluate those, those proposals that different vendors provided and make sure they met the design requirements and do a cost analysis and um, ultimately choose a supplier to provide the pump. I would also do this for things like heat exchangers or big tanks that we needed to install on the, on the site. So mechanical engineers were responsible for some of that mechanical equipment and the design of that, those aspects of the plant. But we always worked in a concert with a group of engineers civil engineers, electrical engineers, control system engineers, uh, en engineers, construction personnel, startup and testing personnel, a very diverse group of backgrounds and people that um, you're, you're always working together so that when you're building something so complex as a power plant, um, you always have this team that you're working with. And that's something that I love about engineering, this collaborative approach to things. Also the ability to meet and work with experts in different areas. I got to work with um, specialists in noise abatement when we were building power plants in sensitive areas. I got to work with specialists in environmental protection to make sure that we weren't harming the surroundings when we were building a plant. I worked with community representatives to make sure that we were understanding the needs of the community. So it's an incredibly collaborative job um, and so exciting when you're building something uh, so complex like a power plant or a new car or who knows what. So many, the, you know, use your imagination, airplanes, rockets. Um, the final picture is a special one for me because it's the last power plant that I got to build before transitioning to my teaching career. I um, got to see this plant, which is a, a combined cycle natural gas fire plant in Sacramento, and I got to go see it go from an, just an idea on a piece of paper to a preliminary design, and then detailed design, construction. I went to oversee the performance testing and startup and ultimately got to see it go into commission and was there for the celebratory commissioning uh, party. So um, for me, these are some of the best things about engineering is seeing something go from just an idea on a piece of paper to something um, real and tangible that helps a community and provides a service to a community and also to be able to work with a team of amazing people to solve really hard problems. So let's get to it. Let's figure out what machine learning is all about. I was really fortunate to work with two engineering students from Notre Dame on this challenge. James and Gigi were so great and provided so many creative ideas that helped support the building of this challenge. And so I hope that as you work through this in the next few classes with your classmates, that you find things that speak to you in particular. Hopefully you'll find something that is really interesting or something you wanna pursue or look at in more depth. Have you ever wondered how apps like Siri 
or the machines like Alexa learn from their users? How is it that that music streaming service you use seems to know what great songs or artists to recommend to you? The answer is data. Millions and millions of pieces of data. With the increase in processing speed and memory, today's computers can be programmed to take in lots and lots of data to try to find patterns that can then be used to predict the next step in a process or provide an answer to a question. And that process is called machine learning. Machine learning is one area of artificial intelligence that is concerned with the idea of replicating human intuition in computers. That sounds like pretty big stuff, but I promise we're gonna break it down and hopefully make it more understandable for you. So let's look at some basics. Let's start with some background information. What is machine learning? You may not realize it, but machine learning drives many processes that you use every day. This little video that I'm going to show you will help you learn a little bit more about how a computer uh, machine learning algorithm is a little different than a normal computer algorithm. And it's going to use the case study of the classic game of rock, paper, scissors. So let's start with a very simple example. Consider you're creating a game of rock, paper, scissors. When you play this with a human, it's very basic. Every child can learn it in just a few minutes. Now let's take a look at the most basic part of a game that the human brain is really good at, and that's recognizing what it's actually looking at. So consider these images. Most people can look at them and instantly recognize which ones are rock, which ones are paper, and which ones are scissors. But how would you program a computer to recognize them? Think about all of the diversity of hand type, skin color, and even people who do scissors like me with their thumb sticking out, and people who do scissors with their thumb in. If you've ever written any kind of code, you'll instantly realize that this is a really, really difficult task. It might take you thousands or tens of thousands of lines of code, and that's just to play rock, paper, or scissors. So what if there was a different way to teach a computer to recognize what it sees? What if you could have a computer learn in the same way that a human does? That's the core of machine learning and the path to artificial intelligence. So traditional programming looks like this. You have data, for example, a feed from the webcam, and you have rules that act on this data. These rules are expressed in a programming language and are the bulk of any code that you write. Ultimately, these rules will act on the data and give you an answer. Maybe it sees a rock, maybe it sees a paper, and maybe it sees scissors. But what if you turn this diagram around, and instead of you as the programmer figuring out the rules, you instead give it answers with the data and have the computer figure out what the rules are? That's machine learning. So now I can have lots of pictures of rocks and tell a computer that this is what a rock looks like, and this is what paper looks like, and this is what scissors looks like and I can have a computer figure out the patterns that match them to each other. Then my computer will have learned to recognize a rock, paper, and scissors. That's the core of building something that uses machine learning. You get a set of data that has patterns inherent in it, and you have a computer learn what those patterns are. So how do computers do this? How do they take in this enormous amount of data in order to recognize words and numbers and images? The answer is machine learning algorithms. There are many models that researchers and, uh, and data scientists have created over the years. And some of these models are really well suited for image data, others for sequences such as text or music, some for numerical data, and others for text data. Could you think of some other examples where machine learning programs might be very useful tools to detect patterns in data and make decisions about them? You may have thought of applications like email spam filters or credit card fraud detection, or perhaps advertising programs that send you what sometimes seems to be super specific targeted ads. 
Machine learning is also being used to analyze millions of medical images to better detect tumors in human tissues. So there are many, many, many applications for this type of technology. This slide is another way of looking at how computers make decisions. An algorithm can be any set of rules that is used to solve a problem. But we often think of this as how computers solve problems. The way a machine learning program or algorithm is different is that you give a computer a teaching set of data from which it identifies patterns and you allow it to analyze a new set of data and make predictions. The more data the computer analyzes, the better it gets at its predictions. It gains experience and refines that model it's using to get more accurate decisions. So I'm now going to show you an example of a, um, a, a machine learning algorithm that tries to predict the numerical digit from a handwritten digit on the left side box. Okay, so this is a digit recognition algorithm and you can see that it's using something called a convolutional neural network. That's a big word and I'll explain it in a few minutes, but let me just demonstrate how it works. I'm going to write a digit on the left and try the number nine and see if it recognizes it. It didn't quite get it and you can see that it had a half, it, it's predicted that it could be a one or it could be a nine and it chose a one. So it made a prediction based on a model that it's using. Let me see if I can draw the nine differently and see if it makes the prediction better. Okay, this time it really thinks it's a seven and maybe a three. You can see from the probabilities. But maybe you're starting to get an idea of what this computer algorithm is doing. Let me try it again. Maybe I can get it better this time. There we go. This time it really knew it was a nine. So how does it make those predictions? How does it think about uh, the number that's being written on the left? What is the computer seeing? Let's take a look. In this slide, you can see on the left side is a sample of a famous set of handwritten digits. It's called the MNIST database of handwritten digits. On the right side is a blown up, blown up image of one of the digits, the number nine. And as you can see, this image is made up of a 20 by 20 array of pixels of varying scales of brightness, varying gray scale. This is how a computer sees this image as a series of 400 pixels in each uh, pixel, a number representing the brightness. What does that look like? It looks like this. This is a lot of data, but basically that's that 20 by 20 array. And in each of those boxes is a different level of brightness. Now, right now, I know it's very hard for you to see that that's a nine. But if I show you the pixels with the brightest uh, grayscale, with the brightest levels, you can see the image of a nine start to emerge. And this is how a computer sees the number nine. The type of algorithm, as we mentioned, that would be used for this kind of learning is called a neural network, a convolutional neural network. This is an algorithm which can take an input image, assign an, import, an importance like a, a learnable type of weight, in this case, perhaps the grayscale value, to various objects in the image, and then be able to differentiate one from the other. So here on the left are an example of all the handwritten nines. You can see them all circled there. And that was what the computer used to learn what the number nine is. You can see that there's models for all the digits zero through eight as well. And what the computer does is it looks at the 20 by 20 array of brightless, brightness levels and it tries to choose the correct model. Is it a nine? Is it an eight? Is it a one? And then it assigns a probability to that. So that's exactly what we saw in the program example that I showed you. 
I recognize that this is pretty complicated stuff, but don't worry, you're not gonna be developing a neural network to recognize digits today. We have, a, we have a simpler challenge that we hope represents the steps that a computer uses to do a machine learning algorithm. Before we get started on the challenge, I'm wondering if any of you are thinking, are there things a computer can do that we humans can't? And conversely, can you think of things that humans can do that computers can't do? You may have thought about data again. Computers are able to look at millions and millions of pieces of data very quickly compared to humans. A computer can scan the pitch and tone of millions of songs very quickly to suggest another song for you that you may want to add to your playlist. But humans are really good at just taking a few examples of something new and starting to learn to build a model or to make a decision about it. Computers would need much, much, much more data in order to do that as well. But this doesn't even consider things like having good judgment or being able to understand the situation to make a wise decision. So with all of this background, let's get to the lab activity today. Here's what you're going to do. You are going to build a catapult. Um, you're going to use the catapult as your machine and you're going to learn how it performs by varying several input factors. And then you're going to use the data that you c collect to create a model that will then try to predict the distance a, cat a, a projectile will go when you launch it. Now you might be wondering, we've just been talking about machine learning. Why are you asking me to build a catapult? What does this have to do with machine learning? Well, we wanted you to see that we're asking you to build a catapult to learn about the performance characteristics of a machine. We know that machine learning is a really complex process and we understand with the time you have, you're not going to be able to complete a machine learning algorithm. So we're asking you to build a catapult where you are doing the machine learning by examining the variables of the performance of this catapult. You're gonna use that data um, to learn about it, examine these variables, and then use the catapult as your tool. Put another way, if we go back to that machine learning algorithm that we, we saw earlier in this presentation, here's some of the steps that you'll see along the way. You're going to build a catapult. The next step is you're going to test various input factors and collect data. The data that you collect, you're going to analyze, perhaps graphically, and you're going to develop a model. Using that model, you're going to predict how to set up your catapult so that it will hit a certain target. So if you look at that diagram, hopefully you're seeing the parallel between the catapult that you're learning about and a machine learning algorithm. Machine learning is based on the engineering design process. As you saw in the introductory engineering video you watched earlier, there is an iterative process when designing any product or solving an engineering challenge. You have to research that challenge, design for it, build it, test it, and analyze it. And each time you do that, you want to improve upon it. You want to iterate on it so that you're continuously improving the prototype that you build. This is kind of the same as the machine learning process. You can see the parallels there. Iteration is a key step in the engineering design process and a computer with a machine learning algorithm is constantly iterating to try to improve its ability to predict the answer, the outcome. So let's learn a little bit about catapults. Catapults can be built in a number of different ways but they all have 
similar parts. You need to have a good base, a good base and frame so that it's rigid and can be, can repeat its performance. It needs to have an arm or a lever that you pull back um, and it needs to be able to spring back. So it needs to have some sort of elastic spring ability in it so that it launches the um, projectile into the air. Um, some catapults have a stop so that the, uh, the arm stops and the projectile goes forward. And all the while, I want you to keep in mind that you are trying to get as much potential energy out of your catapult to transfer to the kinetic energy of the projectile. So you're trying to optimize the amount of energy. So you want to build something that's, that's strong and sturdy and where you don't lose a lot of that potential energy in your device. You want as much of it to get into your projectile to go as far as it can. The other thing I want you to keep in mind is you're trying to learn about the performance of this uh, catapult. So when you're, when you're testing it, only change one variable at a time so that you can understand how that particular characteristic of your catapult affects the performance. Let's break that down a little more. Here you can see some of the supplies that you're going to have. And on the, on the left is a breakdown of the engineering design steps uh, to build your catapult. We've already kind of defined the problem. Um, you can research different types of catapults to get inspiration about your design. You're also going to do, put research into learning about how to optimize your particular, your unique catapult design. Um, you're going to build it and then test it, and then you're going to try to enhance it as best you can. But all the while, when you're testing it, you will be collecting data to learn about it. Let me show you what that might look like. Here's some things you could potentially vary in the design of your prototype. Um, you may decide to vary the type of rubber band you use to change the elasticity or the spring of your catapult. Or you may decide to change the location of the fulcrum, the point at which the um, you bend back the, the catapult arm. So on the left, you can see a picture. Prototype one is one that varies the fulcrum. You can see there's a stack of popsicle sticks and you can move that up and down the base of the catapult to try to change the, the amount you can kind of stretch the catapult arm back. On the right is a different type of prototype where you can pull back the arm of the catapult different amounts and then see how far the ball goes, the projectile goes each time. So what does collecting your data look like? Here's an example data table. In this case, we've got a column for the height, a column for the angle that the arm is pulled back, and then a measurement of the distance the projectile travels. Um, if I show you a completed version of this data table, you can see that the height is never changed. Again, we're trying to only change one design aspect at a time. And in this case, we've varied the amount we pull back the arm in order to see how far the projectile travels. And it's okay if you don't have a way to measure the amount of degrees you've pulled it back. You can also use words like a third of the way back, a quarter of the way back, etc., or an inch of the way back, two inches of the way back. You can provide your data as long as you can then repeat it on your catapult when you uh, do future testing. Here's an, another example where the um, fulcrum is moved. And so in the picture on the top, you can see the popsicle sticks are located kind of closer to the projectile end of the device. And then in the bottom picture, you can see that the fulcrum is located all the way into the, the very, uh, as far away from the projectile as possible. So that's going to allow you to have as much spring as possible when you launch your projectile. And when that data is collected, you can see that this 
model has used the same number of sticks and has varied where those sticks are located on the arm, on the base of the catapult to change the fulcrum. And then the um, distance of, that the projectile went was measured. Let me show you how this projectile worked by showing you this quick video demonstration. So once you've gathered that data, how do you analyze it? How do you create a model that you can then use to predict the distance a projectile will fly based on certain settings? One way is to plot the data. And so here's a graph with the data we just saw on the previous slide, slide plotted. You can see it's got the catapult setting and then it's got the distance the projectile traveled. What catapult setting should you use to fly 200 centimeters? Well, if you look at the graph and you go over to a distance of 200 centimeters, you can see that you should get close to that setting if you place your popsicle sticks, um, if you put it in a catapult setting between four and five centimeters. Now you can do things where you change multiple factors. How would you analyze that data when you're looking at multiple performance characteristics? So let's look at this. Take a look at this data. Here you can see that initially um, four sticks were used and then the distance on the arm on the base of the uh, catapult was varied to get certain measurements and then you can see the number of sticks was reduced to three and then two so all that data was collected and then the way it would look graphically is to plot each set of data as a separate curve so then you can get an idea of how it would perform under each of these circumstances. For those of you who like to use um, Google Sheets or Excel, you could plot your data in an Excel spreadsheet or a Google Sheets spreadsheet and do a similar kind of model. So in both cases, we're creating a graphical model to analyze the performance of the catapult. If you happen to get linear data, guess what you could do? You could run a regression and you could try to get an equation of that line. Um, here you can see that the equation of the line in this, in this example is uh, 0.417x plus 19.8. I'm looking at the equation up at the top part of the graph. That way you could put in any value for the pullback angle and predict the distance it would go. Any value X to predict the distance Y. So here's a regression analysis that's used to do something similar to what we saw before. So that's our challenge. Let's go back and just summarize. You are using, you are kind of machine learning using a catapult. How is the catapult an example of machine learning? Well, just like a computer needs copious amounts of input data to produce a very good output prediction, you will be trying to collect a lot of data, perhaps the pullback angle, perhaps the distance along the arm, uh, the base of your catapult to produce a desired output, which is hitting a target a certain distance away. You're going to create a model for your catapult by graphically analyzing your data. And then you're going to extrapolate information from your graph to try to predict the distance your projectile would travel based on a certain input criteria. So that's it. That's the challenge for today. And that's an introduction to machine learning. If you would like to learn more about what types of engineers study machine learning or even learn more about it. Some topics you might be interested in researching further are AI, artificial intelligence, computer algorithms like neural networks, 
Um, and also looking at the tools that we analyze the data with and that computers use as well, statistics and regression. The types of engineers that would be involved in this kind of uh, study are really all of them, uh, but I've got listed a few, mechanical engineers, a computer scientist, a mechatronics might be involved in, in combining the um, movement of a machine with the algorithm, with the computer coding. And then um, there's also, if you're specifically interested in machine learning, you might want to look into computer science, computer engineering, or system engineering. So I really hope you have fun with this challenge. Enjoy building those catapults. I hope that you build a machine that can really land on an accurate, at an accurate point based on your input criteria. And I hope you have a ton of fun with this challenge. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Joanna Caudill again, and I'm here to introduce you to a couple of new extensions that we have added this summer, and we're excited to share them with you to complement the machine learning challenge. Whether you've completed the challenge and want to explore more, or you want to learn a little bit more about what other options are available to you after you finish the challenge, that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. And we've come up with two options. We've come up with a uh, cool classifying simulation that you can create where you're gonna create, create a sorter um, using a, a product from Google called uh, Google's Virtual AI Sorter. It's a very cool simulation. And then if you're more interested in kind of understanding a little bit more detail about neural networks and how do you code a computer pro a computer to actually um, build a neural network, we've got a really cool simulation playground that uh, is developed by a company called TensorFlow. TensorFlow is this um, organization that has free open source software for lots of computer scientists and engineers to, to help build neural networks. And they've developed this playground that's very, a very cool introduction to more sophisticated neural networks. So let's get going, let's dig in. This teachable machine sorter is going to be a, a kind of a fun simulation for you to have another taste of how machine learning works you're going to be challenged with developing a sorter that can help uh, perhaps uh, maybe a recycling company sort trash. Um, there is approximately 69 million tons of uh, recycled and 25 million tons of composted material um, that needs to be sorted annually. And um, so you can imagine this is a huge problem for uh, recycling companies. And surely there could be better technologies that would allow companies to sort things more efficiently. And so you're going to have a taste of that in this extension. You know that different types of materials uh, that you can we all recycle and compost, I, I hope, and uh, there's many, many different types. And how would a machine know which ones to sort through? That's what we can try to practice today. The Teachable Machine from Google is a really cool uh, interface, and it offers you a simple program to build a training model. Um, and I'm going to just briefly show you what that website looks like and how you can build a, a, a model that you can use to do some classifying. So here we are on Google's Teachable Machine, which is a classifying, a program that classifies data. And the data that um, can be entered into this program is image data from um, a webcam, or you can even upload images from your camera, or it can also do audio data. And so I'm going to just show you a little bit about it. I created a little uh, classifying pro project that 
tries to classify between a collection of pens and a collection of pencils. So I've got lots of pencils and lots of pens. And now I'm going to just show you the model that I created. And so here we are on, um, I, I picked an image classifying model and here we are in the model I created. And the way I did that was I just used the webcam to take pictures of a bunch of different pencils. And then I, in my, my, for my second category, I took pictures of a bunch of pens. And then once I had those pictures up, entered, I just clicked this button saying train the model. And so the model is now looking for things that look like my images of pencils and things that look like my images of pens. And you can, you might be able to see my picture in the camera right now. And what the data, what the output is showing is that it's 90%, 96% sure that I might be a pencil. So I'm not saying it's the best model, but it's an example to show you. So now let's see how it does on an actual pencil. So let me hold up an actual pencil that I haven't trained it on and see how it does. So I'm gonna get out of the picture, there you go. And you can see from the output that it's sure that it's a pencil, almost sure. Um, if I hold up a pen, here's a pen and it's thinking, it's a little unsure. You can see it bobbing back and forth, but I think it's deciding, no, I think this is a pen. So the program is using an algorithm trying to differentiate between these two. Now it turns out that I have pens and pencils that look a lot alike. So that's, it's a hard, it's a hard thing for it to distinguish between. For example, again, here's a pen, but it's kind of confused about which one it is. 50-50 chance. And here I'm going to hold up a paintbrush and it's almost sure that that's a pencil. So it's a, this was a tough uh, challenge for this classification model because it didn't have a lot of data that it was trained on, but it gives you an idea of how you can very quickly create um, a fun classification model and uh, challenge yourself to try to create something that might sort recyclable material or some other thing, uh, objects that you would like to sort between. So now let's go back to our presentation and let me just walk you through a little bit more detail about what you're going to do. So you can pick how you would, how you would like to classify materials or by type or by uh, cardboard versus plastic, for example. That's up to you with your team. You're going to either create an AI sorter that sorts between different materials, kind of like I did, or you could pick one that sorts between at least two materials. And you could think about how you would like to do that. So maybe you want it to pick uh, between cans and bottles or things like that. So have fun with that if that's the option for ex the extension that you choose to use. Um, and I think you can do this pretty quickly with your team and create a very quick machine learning classification model. When you're doing this, you're going to be asked to do it with a, f a small sample, a little bit of data, and then a bigger amount of data. And you should be able to see that you're going to get a much more sophisticated model th with the more data that you have. And that's a thing about machine learning is that a model is only as good as the data that it has to train it. And we'll see that even more in the next extension. So here's some information for you to record. What was, um, what did you, what was the object you used? How well did the model predict it? You'll be doing that in your engineering workbook. And that is the first challenge. The second option for an extension is one that's going to let you play with a little bit more sophisticated neural network in this really cool simulation developed by TensorFlow. So you're going to build your own neural network in the same way that computer scientists and engineers are doing that right now for companies like Google, Amazon, etc. So this uh, extension was developed by a team this summer, including myself uh, and uh, three current engineering students, 
uh, at, at Notre Dame and MIT. So we had this great expertise of recent uh, college engineering students helping us develop the computer program. In this activity, you're going to again use the engineering design process like you did before, but you're going to get a little more into the details of how can we program a computer to think and to kind of think like a brain and our brains. And the way we do that is by modeling a pro creating a model that sort of thinks in the same way or works and processes data in the same way that our brains do. And that is called, it's a type of machine learning called a neural network. So a neural network is a computer program modeled after the human brain that allows computers to make decisions about data on their own without step-by-step -step instructions. And I'll get into that in a little more detail. Here's what the second extension involves. We're gonna introduce you to neural networks with TensorFlow. I'm gonna to try to help you see the connections between the Catapult Lab that you may or may not have already completed. And then I'm going to show you how you can tinker and play around in the TensorFlow Neural Network Playground. TensorFlow is this open source library of machine learning and artificial intelligence code. It is used, parts of these codes are used by engineers and scientists every day to help build sophisticated neural networks. Um, the playground itself is was developed by engineers to allow you to see kind of what goes on behind the scenes with an actual neural network. And it's going to use um, four data sets that it will build a model off of. So the TensorFlow play Playground has features that are kind of like the way you input the data. And then it has layers that contain neurons in them. And neurons are the way that uh, the data gets classified. It's the way that um, the way that the the computer, essentially the mathematics, which I'll get into in a minute, the way the computer processes that data to see how well it can sort colored dots. The goal of the program is to classify and predict where colored dots will be in a data set. So it's kind of a simple set of data, but it's showing you the complexity of a neural network. So how is this connected to the catapult activity? Well, remember that the catapult activity, you develop data or you will develop data on your catapult by measuring various things. You'll record the output. In other words, how far does your, your projectile go? And you'll record that data or have recorded that data and then you'll analyze it. The input data can be things like the pullback angle, uh, the height that you launch your projectile from, how many rubber bands you use to create the el elasticity. And the output data is the distance the ball travels. In a neural network, um, the input data will be these predetermined data sets, which you'll see in a minute. There's uh, one that has data classified in two sections, one that has data kind of in a spiral, and one in a circle, etc. cetera. Um, the features in the neural network model are the same as the features that you varied in your catapult design or will vary in your catapult design. So the features are things like the X value of the data, the Y value of the data. You can also enter data in the way that brings in the sine of X of the data, etc. The output for this neural network model is how the colored dots get classified. Um, and then the error that's measured, in the case of your catapult, it's the difference between the distance the projectile actually went versus what you predicted. And in the neural network model, it's the difference between the predicted color and the actual color in the data set. So that, I'll show you an example, and I think this will make more sense to you. When you think of the importance that you give to each feature in your catapult model, 
you can also make a connection between in that same thing in the neural network. In other words, the neural network will apply a heavier weight or influence on certain parts of the model than others. And you will see that in the bolder lines of the neural network model. Right now, I've got Annie, a student from Notre Dame in computer science, who's going to kind of walk you through an initial introduction to the TensorFlow playground. And she's got a, going to do a great job of showing you how the simulation works. Hi, everybody. Welcome to your neural networks lab extension. Right now, I'm going to show you how to use the playground. So right over here, we have data, and there are four options. And essentially, this is what you want your machine to guess on um, the output you want to get. So you have a linear option, a circular option, a four quadrants kind of option and a spiral option. And the more complex the figure is, um, the harder it's going to be for that machine to um, guess it. So right now we're going to play around just with the linear option. And you can see that right here, I'm feeding it two features. So these are the data inputs that I'm giving the machine that I wanted to learn from. Over here, hidden layers, basically the different trials that it's going to go through. So if I added more hidden layers, it's going to give more of a guess and use those weights accordingly. Right now, we're just going to use one hidden layer to kind of demonstrate how it works. Um, the neuron itself right here is the guess that it's using. If I add more neurons, it's going to have more guesses. And as the machine is um, doing its trials and seeing what's actually working and what's not, um, it may place more weight on different neurons. So right now, when I test it, I'm going to press play. And you can see that over here, I have a training loss of about 0 0.046, which is really good. It means that only 46 out of a thousand trials are um, failing. However, let's say I change the features that I'm adding. So let's get rid of this one and let's add this one. So notice how this feature that I'm adding the input does not look much like the data over here. When I press play now, you can see that the um, trading loss is a lot higher and that's because the data I'm giving it to use isn't as helpful to the machine. So, um, but imagine that I was trying to find this. This is the output I want. Then if I use this one, the training loss is going to be about 0.139. However, if I use an uh, input that looks nothing like it, like this or in this, the training loss is much, much higher. So based on what you want to see, imagine what information the machine's going to use that's going to be most helpful. And you can also, I'm going to go back to the linear one. If I add more hidden layers, um, and let's say it gives some more input, it's going to also change, right? So right now we're still hovering about 0 0.05. Um, you can see these different weights is how much out of percentage out of one, I guess, that uh, the machine is placing emphasis on based on whether or not uh, using them is effective or not. And so typically a rule of thumb is the more layers you use, the more accurate it'll be, the more neurons you have, the more guesses, right? You have the more accurate your machine's going to get as well. However, this isn't always the case. You're going to have to play around with it, determine which features are most helpful. And that's your challenge for the rest of this lab. As you saw, when you look in the playground, you're going to try, I, I want you to play around in it yourself. So try running a few models, watch how the model changes over the course of time as you see the number of, they're called epochs, and those are the um, when, a, when a model has run through all of the training data. And see how it changes and how it weights lines uh, differently over time as it gets better and better at making predictions. You're also going to find that um, the training loss or how accurate the model is, is going to change over time. And if you change a data set, you're going to find that the model that you've created might be good on one set of data, but is not very good on another. Um, there's one model, the spiral, that's quite complex, that's very hard for the, for the playground to um, to create a, an accurate model for. So I challenge you to try to see if you can figure out how to create an, a model that will accurately classify a spiral set of data. How does the model work? Well, what it does is it's got these predetermined data sets. There's four. You can see highlighted right now the circle data set, but there's one that's kind of um, 
It's called Gaussian, where there's essentially two pods of orange and blue dots. There's a spiral, and there's one where uh, the dots are kind of in each quadrant. And so you're going to use that data to help train and then test your model. Um, it uses about half the data to train the model, and then it uses the other half to test it. How does a computer program classify data? Well, I want you to look at the simple uh, data set where the data is kind of in two quadrants, the lower left and the upper right. Um, you could bring in each data in a way that you maybe bring in the X values and you bring in the Y values. And then you might think, how could I classify the orange dots as orange and the blue dots as blue? Perhaps you could draw kind of a line right down the diagonal from the top left down to the bottom right. And you could say that any dot that has an X value and Y value above a certain point is a blue dot. And if it's below that point, it's an orange dot. That could maybe be one way you would classify the data. What does that look like mathematically? Well, it looks like the equation of a line. You could say that maybe if the sum of the X value plus the Y value is bigger than some threshold value, some, some predetermined value, then the dot is blue. And I think you might be able to imagine how you could write a computer code that might allow you to do that. That's exactly kind of the math that a neural network program uses to start classifying data. So we could say that if we had certain neurons and if the neurons, if the sum of these neurons was above a certain threshold value, then the dot is blue. We might find that one of the characteristics of the neuron, for example, um, are all the data points below, below a certain value blue, has less weight than another neuron. So if you look at this picture, you can see that the neuron on the bottom, and I'll put my mouse around it so you can see it, better matches the original data set that we have. And so the model is starting to use more of that neuron, more is being influenced more by that neuron by showing you a darker weighted line for that neuron. If you wanted to build an even more sophisticated model, you could add more layers to your model and then you could characterize the data even more carefully. So what are you gonna do today? First, you're gonna play around with the model. Trust me, it's super cool. Um, and as you saw in the video that Annie put together, it's very easy and intuitive to use. Um, and what I would like you to do is create your own simple model and test it out on all four data sets and see what kind of error rate you get after you let it run for a short amount of time. And a short amount of time would be in a neural network, you measure time in how many cycles of training data uh, the model has gone through, and that's called an epoch. Your first challenge is create a simple model, something with five items, something with, you know, a number of features and a number of neurons that adds up to five, and then run the model and record the error loss for each of the data sets. And you can even do it again for a more sophisticated model. In our team, we were only able to get a total error rate that was just above 50%. So for this, when we summed all of the errors that we collected for the different data sets, none of us could get below 51% or 0.51. So I challenge you, please let us know if you can get an error rate below that value for your total, for your model, for all four data sets. So if you want to find out a little bit more about how neural networks are used in the real world in businesses like Google and Amazon, this is a cool video you could watch in your student interactive workbook. And if you'd like to learn more about how a neural network works a little bit more behind the scenes and see more how it's 
more behind the computer coding, then this would be a great video for you to watch. We've also included in your student interactive workbook uh, a bunch of examples of the types of engineering and science that are used or who would be using these types of tools in their daily jobs. And I hope at least that we've left you with the curiosity to explore more. I can personally say that I didn't know a huge amount about neural networks at the beginning of the summer, but I'm so intrigued by this rapidly developing field um, and how artificial intelligence is really, um, we're starting to see it in so many different tools that we use every day. Thank you so much for your attention today. I hope that you've learned a little bit more. I hope you're curious to learn even more and about this evolving field. Um, have fun and see you soon.